Burnett Quadro Gallman. And tonight, Dr. Gallman will be beginning a 10-piece 10, 10 series of 10 classes on ancient African history. It's really clear that we can't teach people uh, about people's history in South Carolina without understanding where the people came from, what circumstances they arrived with, and what lies and misinformation we have been told about them. And so we're here to unpack that. We appreciate your presence, and Dr. Gallman will um, take over from here. But let me just tell you that, that um, Bernie, some of us call him Bernie, some of us call him Quadjo, but he, he is known around the country as somebody that is a, a real dedicated person in lifting up African history. And he's also a board member, national board member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. And so he didn't make this stuff up. He's been living it for a long time and sharing it with people. And we're really glad to have Dr. Goldman tonight. So Bernie, take it over. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say welcome. And uh, this is kind of the, um, the preparatory uh, class for what is going to be happening over the next few weeks. Um, and I'm going to, without further ado, share my screen. Uh, let me do this and see if I can put this out of the way if I can. Okay. This is in, I'm trying to do some housekeeping here. So we're gonna be talking about the history of history or basically historiography. I didn't wanna say historiography because the first time I heard that word, it kind of scared me. But we're gonna talk about that and we're gonna talk about the race card and some other things. So um, as a disclaimer, I'm not a formally trained historian, but I've been studying, observing and teaching history for more than 35 years, almost almost half my life. And I've been fortunate to be taught and guided by some of the greatest historical minds ever known. So what you're going to hear uh, coming up is uh, kind of an hors d'oeuvre, is, is uh, something to whet your appetite. It's not a complete story. I'm gonna skip over some things, but I'm uh, hoping to be able to uh, stimulate some things. Um, now, some of the images that you're gonna see may be disturbing, so get ready. I also use the terms Black, African-American, and AUSA interchangeably. AUSA meaning African from the United States of America. And note that I always spell the word Africa with a K in keeping with the languages of some African countries that don't have a C in their alphabet. So some of the framing questions are, should one accept someone else's interpretation of their history? Should one accept someone negating their history or deeming it unimportant? If not, what do you do? Should one correct inaccuracies, omissions, or flat out lies in the telling of their history by others? If so, how should that be done? Should one care what others teach about their history? And why is African and Aousa history feared by so many people? Um, objectives to introduce and explore. And, and I'm going through this now because I'm not going to do this again in any of the other lectures. So I want to get this out of the way. But my objectives uh, are to um, introduce and explore the manner in which people uh, have manipulated history against Black folk worldwide. And I wanna stimulate, hopefully, some of you to uh, do research. And, uh, okay, I left that before. To do research and maybe even create some activists for 
the truth discovered through the research and to rethink and and start doing some corrections and illustrate the relationship between the past and the present. So questions that I get asked a lot is, why does everything have to be about race? And what is the race card? So here's some teaspoonfuls, but realize it is not the whole picture. Um, I think for this group, I, I don't really have to go into exactly what critical race theory is, other than to say that it's a tactic, the criticism is a tactic uh, for political purposes. And um, I don't ha have to say what it's not, even though it's, it's, it's really interesting how ignorant people have latched on to some of the lies being told. And they, uh, <laughs> I like some of the memes and some of the recordings, uh, reels that I see where someone is saying, oh, I hate hit, uh, critical race theory. But then when they're saying, well, what is critical race theory? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but I know I don't like it. And that's always uh, telling. Racism in America is so prevalent and it's so American that most folk don't even realize that they racist because anti-Africanism's in the air, the water, and in the dirt. Racism in America is so American that racists interpret efforts to understand, study, and eliminate racism as anti-American communist propaganda. An old African proverb says, until the history of the hunt is told by the lion, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. But we're going to de-glorify that hunter today. What is history? That's supposed to be a record of past events, but is it a true record? And is it uh, objective or is it based on the writer's opinions and the biases? So then the ultimate question is, is the writing of history truthful, accurate, and objective? I'm going to skim over this, but there are certain concepts in history that are are very, very important. Uh, but uh, for, for purposes of what we're doing today, we sh it should be understood that uh, perspective is important, but is almost always uh, sacrifice, uh, cause and effect. You know, uh, one of the things that my brother, Joe Benton used to say is, we talk about the people and the events, but we don't talk about the importance of the events and what those events uh, were caused by or what they caused. So what is historiography? And it's defined as the study of the writing of history. So when you study that, do you conclude that the uh, writing of history is truthful, accurate and objective, or neutral? Uh, we're going to decide that hopefully by the end of, of this little time together. George Orwell put it very well. Who controls the past controls the future and who controls the present controls the past. So what we're doing is we're in a struggle in the present for our past. Dr. Valethea Watkins, who is a brilliant young uh, woman who is on the faculty at Howard University, says a lot of things that I like to repeat, but one that is more in keeping with what we are talking about today is, and I wanna read this, the control by outsiders over the construction of a people's historical narrative inevitably shapes, influences, and defines what that people will do or fail to do in their own best interests. Um, Dr. Anderson Thompson on the left um, uh, said this, and, and I think that um, the last part of this quote, it is our sacred mission to cut through the jungle of lies and distortions surrounding the myth that Western European whites were the civilizing race of mankind. Um, to his right is sitting Dr. Jacob Carruthers, 
uh, and um, Dr. Jacob Carruthers uh, is author of a book that I think everyone uh, should should read entitled Intellectual Warfare. Malcolm continues that with, as long as you're convinced that you've never done anything, you can never do anything. One of the things that I was taught early on is that when you read history, and even now when you read the newspapers or listen to, listening to the news, there are certain terms that you have to be very, very uh, careful about. Maybe, may have, was likely, could have been, possibly happened, considered to be probably, perhaps, mystery, arguably, or this is not definitely known. These are uh, warnings of some of the biggest lies ever told. Dr. John Henry Clark says that Black history is the missing pages of world history. The, qu the question, why are these pages missing? So if we understand that much of Black history has been hidden, ignored, changed, and even claimed by others, what is it about Black folk that powerful non-Black people want to ignore and change? Why do they spend so much time, so much energy, and so much money trying to change or hide our history? Do they know something that Black folk don't know? And it's interesting, we're going to talk about uh, formal history, but hiding Black history is not new. Uh, the Henry Berry, right after the Nat Turner Rebellion uh, in Virginia, they had these debates about the future of slavery and, and everything. And Henry Berry actually, I think, was a little schizophrenic because the very first part in Black, he's criticizing surgery. Uh, and uh, in the middle part in red is the part that um, Dr. In, in his book, um, Black Reconstruction in South Carolina, Dr. Jackson uh, said from Aiken says, we have as far as possible closed every avenue by which the light may enter a slave's mind. If we could extinguish the capacity to see the light, our work would be complete. They would then be on the level of the beasts of the fields. Then in the last paragraph, he says, he's ready to continue doing the same old thing. George Graham Best, who was a senator from Missouri, but also a state senator in the Confederacy. And he says, in all revolutions, the vanquished are the ones who are guilty of treason even by the historians, because history is written by the victors and framed according to the prejudices and bias existing on that side. I think that this is, whether this guy was a liar in life, he told the truth that time. Now, Rayford Logan was a historian at uh, Howard University, uh, and he used the word nadir to describe the period from the end of Reconstruction in 1877 through the early 20th century. And he says it was the nadir of race relations. Nadir meaning the lowest point. Uh, that is arguable, but I am using it kind of as a uh, framing point. So what happened during the, uh, the nadir? Well, I'm going to mention that the American Historical Association was uh, founded in 1884 when racism was the norm. And it was the first professional historical association in the United States. And their website describes them as a trusted voice. We're gonna come back to them later, but I think that uh, I want them to be put in perspective of the nadir when racism was the norm in America. So some other things that happened during the nadir were the establishment of what's known as sundown towns in which any AUSA 
in that town had to leave town before sunset. Sunset. Now they existed all over the country, but especially in the South and in the Midwest. And interestingly, I'm told many still exist. I also had to always be conscious and aware of these places because not to be conscious and aware of them could be deadly. This was one aspect of the race card, which actually was uh, life-saving. And some people have said, and, and I've read that some of these Suntown towns were formerly all black towns that were taken over by whites. Oregon was actually a sundown state. In 1844, all Aosa were ordered to leave Oregon. Those who refused could be whipped every six months until they left. Aosa women were given three years to leave and Aosa men were given two years. For South County, a county in Northern Georgia was notoriously violently racist. After two lynchings in the early 20th century, most Iosa were forced to leave the county. Interestingly, in uh, 1987, a civil rights demonstration of about 75 people was violently attacked by some very brave uh, non-Blacks who were numbered about 400. Ferguson, Missouri, where Michael Brown was murdered by policeman Darren Wilson in 2014, 2014 was originally a sundown town. Other states with recognized sundown towns, Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Louisiana, Arizona, Georgia, Oklahoma, Michigan, Washington, Oregon, and South Carolina. Um, and in South Carolina, Sundown towns are listed with the counties they are. Ellington, Georgetown, Alla Palms, Princeton, Shandon in Richland County, which was a little town, uh, Folly Beach, Hamburg, Monks Corner, and Salem. I'm sure there are others. These are the ones that have been uh, documented. So American apartheid was very much a part of the nadir. Um, uh, I can remember when I was a child uh, growing up in Hartsville, we would go to the Sears in Florence and uh, they had these, and, and this may have, that picture may have been taken in Florence actually, uh, where you had the white water and the colored water. And I always went to the colored water to see if it was really colored. And I tried to go to the white water, but my mother would snatch me back because um, I wanted to see what color that water was. Um, movie theaters, um, we had to go, had to sit upstairs. Um, fortunately in Hartsville in the movie theater, the stairs were indoors uh, rather than being outdoors. Lynching was something that was very, very common during American, uh, during the nadir. Now, there's a couple of things about lynching that I think are important to, to, to point out. Lynching was entertainment for many people. And lynchings, as were race riots, which, which we're gonna talk about later, were acts of American domestic terrorism. Uh, despite calls for anti-lynching laws as early as 1898, a law wasn't passed until 2021, 2022, which was the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. Between 1877 and 1950, there were more than 4,000 lynchings in 12 Southern states uh, that are documented at this time. And I hasten to add that. Um, there were 185 in South Carolina. The states with the most lynchings were Mississippi, Georgia, Louisiana, and Arkansas, followed by Alabama, Texas, and Florida. I can't talk about lynching without raising uh, this sister, uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett, uh, was is a 
ancestor who should be known uh, very well and celebrated by everybody. Um, she was probably one of the most courageous human beings uh, who ever lived. She actually publicly called for anti-lynching laws in 1898. And she was uh, a brilliant woman. She was a journalist, educator, newspaper editor, women's rights activist, and human rights activist. activist. Uh, she published pamphlets documenting lynching, and she worked with Frederick Douglass, Mary McLeod Bethune, Marcus Garvey, Monroe Trotter, W.B. Du Bois, and Madam C.J. Walker, Alonzo Herndon, and J. Max Barber, who frequently were much better known than she is, although um, she deserves as much attention and honor and respect as any of them. She actually wrote a pamphlet attacking the exclusion of Iosa from the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. She helped found the Niagara Movement. You know, we hear about W.B. Du Bois, but she was one of the founders. She also helped found the National Association of Colored Women. But when they had the election for the first president, she lost the election to Mary McLeod Bethune, who has become identified with that organization even though uh, this uh, sister also uh, participated in his, in his founding. Um, uh, so let's look at some images of the nadir. And when I, I was recent, I, I was doing some uh, family history research and I have found um, some information written by my great, great sperm donor's son saying that America was the finest civilization ever on earth. So I am subtitling these images, Civilization of Barbarism. Because when you look at these pictures, the gruesome nature of, of the, uh, these pictures is one thing, but I like to look at the faces of the crowd and look at men, women, and children and how they were affected by that. I think that that is extremely telling. Civilization of barbarism. They lynched men, women, and children. Civilization of barbarism. Also, you, when many people hear about uh, race riots, they think about the urban rebellions of the 60s and 70s, but then there were race riots that occurred during the nadir. And I kind of want to also add massacres because they were mostly massacres. Now, this uh, in, 20, in, in 2021, Attention was placed on what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, what was called Black Wall Street. And I heard so many people, uh, mostly non-Black people who were talking about how could I, how come I never learned this in school? And they voiced their righteous indignation, rightfully so, I think. But I think it's very important to understand that that wasn't the only one. There were many, many more. So whether we're gonna call it a race riot or a massacre or both, uh, let's define them. A riot is a disturbance of public peace by three or more people acting together. And a massacre is killing a number of helpless or unresisting people. Uh, because of what happened, I would say that these were massacres. So what happened in Tulsa? That uh, Black Week, the Tulsa's Black Wall Street population, which was a, a, a district of Black people who had moved there and prospered. Um, and it grew from 10,000 in 1910 to 100,000 in 1920. 
during that massacre, more than 300 people were killed and more than 800 people were injured. 35 city blocks were destroyed that included more than 1,200 homes that were not just burned, but they were looted. And you know, it, during the urban riots, I heard uh, so much commentary on the news about looting, but that happened back then. And more than 190 businesses were uh, destroyed. The total damages in today's dollars are greater than 200 million. Nobody was arrested. No insurance claims were honored. And what a lot of people don't know is the, the R&B group, the Gap Band, which led by the Wilson brothers, including the very popular Uncle Charlie Wilson, was from Tulsa. And the name Gap Band was named after three streets in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Greenwood, Archer, and Pine. These are some before and after pictures of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, what happened during these uh, massacres? And they were caused by a combination of jealousy, greed, fear, voter intimidation, suppression, and it was served on a racist bed of white, narcissistic, psychopathic pseudo-supremacy. Now, although these massacres frequently targeted IOSA, there are recorded incidents of massacres of Native Americans, Chinese people, Mexicans, and even white Catholics. Now, although in modern times, the term race riots, as I mentioned, can conjures images of the urban rebellions, it doesn't really tell the whole truth. I'm going to give you a list of some of these race riots or massacres uh, that were perpetrated against people of African origin. Now, these were done before the nadir. So it wasn't just the nadir. The New York ma uh, massacre, 120 hours a dead. Memphis, New Orleans, uh, St. Landry and St. Bernard parishes in Louisiana, Camilla, Georgia, Opelousa, Louisiana, Colfax, Louisiana, Vicksburg, Mississippi. And look at the number of hours that were dead, that were killed in these. Uh, there are more. Clinton, Mississippi. Hamburg, South Carolina, Ellington, South Carolina, Thibodeau, Louisiana, Wilmington, and we'll get back to that. We'll talk about that a little more. Atlanta, Georgia, Springfield, Illinois, and Slocum, Texas. There are more. East St. Louis, Illinois, Longview, Texas, Chicago, Illinois, Charleston, South Carolina, Washington, D.C., Elaine, Arkansas, Okoye, Florida, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Then there's Rosewood, Florida in 1923, and more modern massacres in Orangeburg, South Carolina with uh, the four students, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the move uh, uh, where they destroyed a whole neighborhood to kill Black women, children. And Charleston, South Carolina in 2015, that is in our recent memory. What is important to note in most of these massacres, I was to fault back and were not docile. This was not reported by the mainstream. And even though I listed the number of Ausa who were killed, newspaper accounts rarely mention the number of non Ausa who were killed. Uh, and that number would be considerable in many of those uh, cases because if you look at the timing, most of those, especially during the uh, nadir, occurred after World War I. In fact, in 1919, it was so bad that that summer month was called Red Summer because of the bloodlust and the violence. Because the Africans were coming back from World War I, where they had volunteered to go and try to earn a spot in, in liberty. But they came back and there were just efforts to keep them in their place. 
Um, Tulsa was the very first time that bombs were dropped on an American citizens. Uh, the other time was when uh, uh, skin, uh, uh, not skin folk mayor in Philadelphia authorized bombing of the MOVE organization in 1985. Now back to Wilmington. Wilmington was the only coup d'etat that resulted in the successful violent overthrow of a legally elected government on American soil, much like what was attempted January 6, 2021. Now, all these atrocities had several things in common, including blaming the victims. Um, historians and journalists taught that the Wilmington massacre was caused by violent AUSA. And I think it's important to, to, to hear the true story where you had more than a mob of more than 3,000 non Blacks marauding through the Black community, killing wantonly, looting homes and burning down homes, destroying businesses. And I think that that, that is, is of utmost importance. Now, let's go back to the American Historical Association. When it was founded, white Southerners and white Northerners were in the process of reuniting after the Civil War. And this was done at the expense of AUSA, the Wormley Agreement or the Hayes-Tilden Compromise of 1877, which uh, put the formerly uh, rebellious, treasonous Southern Democrats back in power. In 1913, the annual H AHA meeting was in Charleston, and it was decided then that they would teach about the events of Reconstruction as a failed effort, and they would portray the Iowa legislators and, uh, as uncouth, illiterate, unintelligent, immoral, and dishonest. And they were portrayed as buffoons, even though it was much the opposite. And this effort has been known as the Dunning School. This was named after William Archibald Dunning of Columbia University, who's been called the father of historiographic racism. And his students, generation after generation, spread this falsehood to many universities and colleges, such as Yale, Ohio State, Bryn Mawr, and, and the list is there, to, until the lie became standard. Skip that. African proverb says, a lie has many variations, the truth none. One of the things that uh, Joe Benton, Bobby Derrick Jackson, and I put in uh, our book on uh, uh, rites of passage, Project Sankofa, is that it's very, very difficult to remember a lie, whereas it's very easy to remember the truth. As a matter of fact, Joseph Goebbels, who was the chief propagandist for the Nazi party, said, repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. This is happening today. The Dunning School still exists today and is part of the current anti-CRT Fuhrer. And it's interesting because um, during the early days of the African-centered movement, uh, the critics call them, call it feel good history. And after you do some due diligence and research, you'll find out that what we are being given today that is standard in textbooks is the true feel good history. Now, these falsehoods were accepted as truth by most whites and some Iosa. And uh, these I was included Book, Booker T. Washington and a historian George Washington Williams, although there are some people that debate that. Um, the response was uh, attacked and countered by a number of, of 
so-called black leaders and black intellectuals of that time. Um, interestingly enough, I have Althruis Ambush Taylor who wrote some really, really good uh, books on black history. And I only recently found out that he was white. Um, and, uh, but he's done some good work, but I have him included there. Um, and there are some names listed here that I think everyone should know. I mean, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, most of us know about Ralph Bunch, W.B. Du Bois, I think uh, we know about. Charles Wesley, a lot of people know about. But Anna Julia Cooper, Monroe Work, are uh, individuals who uh, I think that it, uh, should be household names also. And uh, Carter G. Woodson was so adamant that he created his own publishing company because mainstream publishers refused to publish any rebuttals to that. So he created the Associated Publishers and organized the Journal of Negro History and the Negro History Bulletin as vehicles for truth. And if any of you have ever had an opportunity to read uh, the Journal of Negro History, that's some really good stuff in there. And it's written in such a, a lyrical way that I think is, it makes it enjoyable reading. Wilson also founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History in 1915, which is still striving. It's renamed the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, uh, which, um, strives to put Black history in classrooms at the grassroots. Um, other opponents were Ida Wells, Barnett, uh, William Monroe Trotter, who we're going to talk about a little later, uh, and John Hope Franklin. Now, while that was going on, uh, in 1919, the Sons of Confederate Veterans adopted a document by a Miss Mildred Rutherford of Athens, Georgia, who was the historian general of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And it was book was called A Measuring Rod for Textbooks. And this tested textbooks and library books to see if they were, quote, unjust to the South. That sound familiar? The main points of measure, measuring rod for textbook was saying that the Constitution was a compact between sovereign states and one's perpetual, that secession was not rebellion, the North was responsible for the Civil War, the enslaved Africans were not mistreated in the South, uh, coercion was not constitutional, and some other uh, absurd things um, uh, that I'll go over. And I always have to include this. This is the history book that I had in my fourth and sixth grade, written, written by Mary Sims Oliphant. Incidentally, before I go on to that, I think that it's very, very important. Uh, our homeboy, Michael Harriet, did a string on uh, on X that um, traced the, the origin of the woman who wrote that measuring rod for textbooks. And it's, it's fascinating how he uh, does that. So that if you ever go back to X and you pull up Michael Harriet and ask him to go to the founding of uh, uh, Daughters of the Confederacy, I think that would be a very, very interesting read. Um, this is the textbook. I have yelled it out. Most of the Negroes were ignorant and some of them were almost savages. The sudden freeing of the slaves meant a tremendous problem for the whites. And uh, I think uh, here's another. The Congress of the United States kept troops in South Carolina to keep these thieves in power. Negro militia companies were organized and white companies were ordered to disband. I'm not going to go over that anymore. 
but that book was awesome. So now I'm going to do some misleading topics, and we're going to talk about some of the topics that have been misled. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list, but I think this is worth uh, talking about. Now, I'm, my next lecture is going to be on chemists, so I'm going to skip over this. Um, but I always want to point out the giants of chemistry, Dr. Shekanta Joe, Dr. Joseph Ben Yakinen, and uh, just misleading topics number two that slavery saved Africans from savagery and barbarism in Africa. Now, according to the diaries and accounts of the first Europeans and Muslims to visit West and Central Africa, they encountered advanced civilizations with great educational systems and universities and peaceful people. In my third lecture, when I talk about the uh, Africa's and origin of medical science, you'll find that in the 12th, in the 12th and 13th century, there were universe, medical universities in West Africa in which they were removing cataracts from the human eye. I think that's uh, very, very important. Africa had a complex systems of government and uh, Muslim writers commented on the safety of these, but um, these Muslim writers were ignored. Um, we'll talk about that a little more when uh, I do the lecture on the golden age of West Africa. Abolitionists have been painted as allies and friends of the enslaved and free Africans. And this is misleading topic number three. Um, again, my brother, the late Joe Benton said that there were no such thing as free blacks or free Africans at that time. They were just loose in a uh, in in a environment. So even though these uh, abolitionists and so-called liberal whites were against slavery, it didn't mean that they accepted Africans as social, political, or biological equals. Most of them were white supremacists, and most felt that Africans were, at best, uncivilized brutes who could only be redeemed by the indoctrination into white culture. I might add that they felt the same way about Native Americans and they actually kidnapped Native American children and forced them to go to schools where they were force fed this uh, so-called superior white culture. Civilization or barbarism? That is the question. Martin Luther King actually saw that and he said, whites, it must be frankly said, are not putting in a similar mass effort to re-educate themselves out of their racial ignorance. It is an aspect of their sense of racial superiority that the white people of America believe that they have so little to learn. Loose and easy language about equality, resonant resolutions about brotherhood fall pleasantly on the ear but for the Negro, there's a credibility gap he cannot overlook. I won't repeat him anymore. Misleading topic number four, Frederick Douglass versus Henry Holland Garnett. I would bet a dollar to a donut than anybody, everybody on this lecture knows about Frederick Douglass. I also bet that same dollar to a donut that very few of you know about Henry Holland Garnett. But I think it's very, very important to understand that during uh, the early part of the 19th century, Garnett was as popular in the Aousa community as was uh, Frederick Douglass. The difference is that Douglass was written about by whites in the um, Douglas was written about by whites in the uh, newspapers and it was also uh, can you hold for a minute?
Douglas was a favorite of prominent white abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. And as mentioned, was featured in history books and newspapers and was well known. And it was one time that it said that Douglas declared slavish devotion to Garrison. Uh, as mentioned, he wasn't the most popular. There were several people who were, as, who were equally popular. But let's look at some of the positions that they took. Douglas felt that whites should participate in the discussions and debates of the Negro Convention movement. Whereas Garnett said he had no problem with uh, had no problem with uh, sympathetic whites working with other whites to achieve justice, because that's where the problem was. The problem was not with Black folk. Um, and the Negro Convention Movement was a movement of, of loose Africans, as Joe Benton would say, in which they would get together in various places to make decisions on positions that they should take with regard to uh, issues of that particular day. And that's something I think that uh, should be studied uh, in some depth. And I think there are some good references on that. Douglas favored moral suasion, said that uh, slavers would realize the error of their ways and they would make things right. Whereas Garnett actually favored armed resistance. Um, his last speech to the convention movement, I think, is moving. And he said, let your motto be resistance, resistance, resistance. Douglas felt that abolition was not a political issue and politicians should avoid the debate, whereas Garnett said that abolition was absolutely political and should be addressed politically. Douglas was against AUSA immigration outside of the United States, whereas Garnett actually embraced the idea and organized the African Civilization Society, which was uh, in, uh, aimed to, to move Black folk to places outside of the United States. And it should be uh, mentioned that um, this is in, in opposition to the white enslavers uh, Monroe era organization of the African, uh, the um, immigration of Africa that, that led to the creation of Liberia. That's another thing that I think should be looked into. It is ironic that Douglas later embraced and appropriated all of Delaney's positions and took credit for them. Now, another thing that Garnett did was he rescued and republished David Walker's Appeal, which is a book that scared enslavers so much that they banned the book and they offered a bounty for his life. And indeed, uh, he died under very suspicious circumstances. Misleading topic number five is the way that Martin Robinson Delaney has been ignored. He was the most popular AUSA in the early to mid 19th century. Uh, as a matter of fact, he actually, Frederick Douglass convinced him, he had started a newspaper in Pittsburgh and Frederick Douglass visited him and convinced him to close his newspaper and help Frederick Douglass with his newspaper. However, uh, because they were so diametrically opposite in their philosophies, that didn't last very long. And this man was a genius. He was not only a physician, but he was an author, a journalist, a soldier, a politician, novelist, ethnologist, and he is considered to be the father of Black nationalism. Um, he's been ignored. The other misleading topic is Booker T. Washington versus William Monroe Trotter. Again, I would bet a dollar to a donut that most folk here have heard about Booker T. Washington, but not very many of you have heard about William Monroe Trotter. Trotter, uh, we know about the beef between Booker T. Washington 
and W.B. Du Bois, but Trotter was the main one. And he was critical of Washington initially, and Du Bois actually joined in that criticism, but because he had a higher profile, got most of the, the, the ink. William Monroe Trotter was a co-founder of the Niagara Movement along with Du Bois. He was a newspaper man. He created a newspaper in Boston called The Guardian. And one of the main things The Guardian did was attack Booker T. Washington. Uh, Trotter was the first black Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Harvard, whatever that means. And for me, what was interesting, he was the first and only black man who was actually ejected from the White House because he had a verbal confrontation with the racist President Woodrow Wilson. And at one point, uh, Booker T. Washington came to Boston to give a lecture and why, uh, but Trotter and some of his folk heckled him and they got actually got arrested. Misleading topic number seven. When did Africans first come to America? Now we hear about 1619 and uh, that is not accurate. The first Africans of which we have evidence arrived in North America in about 800 BCE, more than 2000 years before Columbus got lost and stumbled upon Hispaniola in the Caribbean. Now, let me put a caveat on that because Michael Harriet in his uh, book, Black AF History has outlined several other people who may have been here before, even before then, before Columbus. The first enslaved Africans that we have evidence of were brought to the eastern coastal part of what is now South Carolina by the Spanish in 1526. And this was also the first known slave revolt uh, of more than 250. Again, one of my later lectures will be on resistance to slavery. So we'll get into that a little bit more detail. Misleading topic number eight, black inventors and scientists. Uh, this is actually one of the main things that children, a lot of children's books uh, portray. So I'm not gonna go into this in any, any detail. And this is a short list. Um, I, I remember seeing a meme saying that if uh, they wanted black folk to leave America, we should take all our inventions with us and see what, uh, what happens. Okay, all these were, misleading topic number nine, black cowboys. I also made up more than 25% and some say as many as 40% of so-called cowboys in the West, even though popular Westerns on TV and film rarely portrayed them. And when they did, they used insulting stereotypes. Notable Alistair Cowboys, Nat Love, Bill Pickett, Bose Eichert, Jesse Stahl, John Ware, and Bash Reeves, uh, uh, which is interesting because I think one of the streaming services has a series based on, on his life. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of it is is not accurate, but at least he's getting some name recognition. Misleading topic number 10, civil rights versus black power. Now these movements to me are too frequently lumped together and the black power movement is conflated with the civil rights movement. However, they basically were dealing with what we now know as human rights. And Malcolm X called it that. Uh, Barbara Derrick Jackson, my friend and my brother, clarified that human rights was the principle while civil rights and black power were tactics. Um, the urban, and this is interesting, the Urban Dictionary defines these differently. The civil rights movements defined as, quote, 
a movement during the 1950s and 1960s that involved the pursuance of equal treatment of blacks and whites in America. But it also defines a uh, black power movement as, quote, a call for separatism that is no different in result to white power, Asian power, Indian power, Egyptian power, or queer power. Separatism is the main cause of racial tensions, yet many people seem blissfully unaware of this whole harm. I think it's very important to uh, mention that um, although urban infers black, the Urban Dictionary was written by a white California Polytechnic State University computer science major by the name of Aaron Peckham in 1999 as a parody of various dictionaries. It has more than 65 million visitors monthly. However, people take him seriously. And I think that's uh, something that we need to look at. In looking at civil rights versus black power, the organizations of civil rights movement, the NAACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, CORE, and SNCC, which started out as a civil rights movement and ended up as a black power uh, organization. Um, the black power movement was divided into uh, two major uh, areas and I have some references. There's a sister who uh, lectures on this, who was a part of uh, the Republic of New Africa and the Black Panthers uh, during that particular time, and uh, uh, gives a fascinating lecture. But she divides this into revolutionary nationalists, which were the Republic of New Africa and the Black Panther Party, and the cultural nationalists the US organization, ASCAC, and NABSW. Um, the tactics were different. Civil rights tactics were marches, boycotts, protests, sit-ins, wait-ins, civil disobedience, whereas Black power dealt with confrontation politics, Pan-African philosophy, cultural expressions, and publishing. Misleading topic number 11, Abraham Lincoln as the great emancipator. Lincoln was a white supremacist, and he really didn't want to free the enslaved Africans. He was more in favor of expelling the non-enslaved Africans from the United States than freeing the enslaved Africans, and actually had to be pressured into issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, which actually freed nobody. Lincoln refused to allow Africans to fight for their freedom until he had no choice. And when uh, the North was losing the Civil War until that uh, they were allowed to fight. And immediately after Africans joined the war, the North started winning battles. So we can't say that the North freed us. What we can say is we freed ourselves. Other ignored topics. I think that um, looking at the uh, conquest of Africa, it's overlooked that Africans were actually uh, fighting against the Europeans successfully and were defeating them until uh, the invention of the repeating gun, the Gatling gun, and the Maxim gun, which allowed uh, the Europeans to kill multiple people from a distance. And that were, made the difference between uh, uh, success and, and defeat in uh, the Africa. Who actually discovered America? It's always been interesting to me that we say that somebody discovered something when there are already people there. Uh, African resistance in Africa and in America, I'm gonna talk about that. The Fort Pillow Massacre, which I think is a, a landmark for civilization, the question of civilization or barbarism. Our African organizations and institutions, 
not enough is said about mutual aid societies. The American Negro Academy, uh, the United Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, which contrary to popular belief was the largest mass movement of black folk worldwide ever known. So why is everything to Ausa about race? I hope to have uh, mentioned that. And I'm gonna take advantage of this time to talk about, uh, do a shameless plug of some of the books that I've written, uh, participated in writing. Um, Sankofa University, um, which uh, includes a large uh, bibliography, but it has essays about various topics um, with, with multiple references. A book written by uh, Bobby Derrick Jackson, Joe Benton, and Dr. Tanya Bryce, and I, Should Black Organizations and Institutions Be African-Centered? Uh, my first novel, To Be Human, um, the second edition of a book written by uh, Joe Benton and Bobby Derrick Jackson on uh, a Rites of Passage program, and my second attempt at a novel, Saving the World. All these are available on uh, Amazon, and as well as the, uh, the first book, To Be African, which I co-edited along with uh, Dr. Marimba Ani and uh, Baba Obadelli Williams. Coming soon uh, is gonna be my maternal family history and the Doyle experience in South Carolina. So I wanna thank you all for uh, taking the time to be here with me and uh, if there are any questions, concerns, comments, corrections, challenges, or criticisms, I would be more than happy to address those now. Brother Quadra, yeah, drop your screen and y'all raise your either your hand or speak up and Dr. Gallman will address your question. Okay, I see. Ron, Ronnie Call. Pick up, Ronnie. Yes, um, and thank you so much for your presentation. Can you see, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I've sat and listened to a lot of the things that are happening right now. Our whole field of social psychology supports the easy ways in which um, untruths are propagated and how they're reinforced in our educational systems and definitely reinforced in looking at history. So I really appreciate, and this is just me saying, I appreciate the presentation today because um, I knew almost every person except uh, the one with Garrett, uh, that one was new. Um, so that was very important. I guess I can show you on my screen here, but um, just continue. Thank you, Brother Roney. Uh, I see some questions in the chat. Uh, James Robinson, please talk about Hamburg, Atlanta, and Wilmington. Okay. Um, Hamburg uh, was very was a very interesting uh, situation because during uh, that period. Of, of time uh, during the time of the Hamburg massacre, uh, there were militias that were being built that um, were aligned with various political parties. And as I alluded to, the Democratic Party of that time was the racist party. Uh, uh, some would say the Republican Party of the day. Um, and the Republican Party was uh, the the less racist party, but they used um, they used um, yeah I won't say that, uh, but they 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 soft they soft pedaled their um, racism. Um, 
Well, on the 4th of July, they, uh, the black militia was, was marching and these uh, whites wanted to pass by and they wouldn't get out of the road. They said, you can go around. So they, um, these white guys started to incite uh, these arrogant colored fellers. Uh, they used the N word. And before you knew it, there were literally hundreds of uh, non-black men assembled and they attacked these black men and killed, I think six of them are reported killed. Um, and what's ironic is that a later governor of South Carolina and senator from South Carolina, Pitchfork Ben Tillman, uh, was a part of that. Uh, and those of you who may not know Pitchfork, he was one of the, uh, the, the mentors of, of um, what's his name, Strom Thurmond. And uh, so I think that's uh, interesting. Um, Wilmington, I, I did go through that and I don't want to go into any more detail, but um, there's some uh, a backstory that a lot of it had to do with them trying to 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 pretend it was about white womanhood, um, but uh, at the same time the the elected officials were forced to resign and frequently forced to leave town. So um, uh, Wilmington was the very first time that. Uh, an elected government it was uh, overthrown, uh, much, much like they tried to do on uh, January in 2001. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, um, okay, my brother uh, puts in here, there are two sundown towns in Alabama, Arab and Coleman. And uh, he's not sure, but um, the black, he, he mentions the Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee. And he wanted to add to the listing, the Eufaula Massacre of 1874. Thank you. Let me write that down and look that up and include that. E U F A L A massacre, 1974. Thank you. Um, the years that covered the Nadir are, it varies. Um, actually, I think um, he intended for it to be 1877 to 19. Before 1919, I forget the exact year, but uh, I extended it to 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 do that because so many massacres and lynchings occurred. Um, and uh, let's see, question number one, uh, number two: How many aspects and what are those aspects of an historical event should be considered to ensure the truth of a matter? Um, that's a good, very good question. I think that in order to ensure truth, we should uh, go to primary sources, try to uh, deal with folks who were there and who recorded it and look at it from uh, very, very different perspectives. Um, I think those are uh, extremely important. I, just accepting something because someone says it, I think is is uh, erroneous. Uh, Mama Ifia? Greetings. Hotep, how are you? Better and better, and yourself? Hanging in somewhere, but I'm <laughs> trying to figure out where. All right, that makes two of us. I wanted, um, I'm curious as to the name of the sister that you mentioned 
who um, was talking about um, the variations from uh, civil rights, human rights, uh, compared to black power. Okay. Um, I was a member of the Atlanta Project of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And the Atlanta Project, the project which wrote the SNCC position paper on black power, Mm -hmm. uh, which was not well received when it was written and released. In fact, it was uh, almost a year of internal conflict around the Black Power or self determination. Uh, one and two, of course, it, the paper itself was released the first of 66 prior to the Meredith March, although. Um, and repudiated, I would add, by Kwame and Mikasa and the SNCC establishment um, at the time until the merit of March, which was later in the year. So I think that the story around that and the transition that it represents, which still has, still has not been told, there's been some inference to it in the recent book by Dan Berger, um, Stayed on Freedom. And I would urge people to consider that as well as Googling the SNCC Atlanta Project by Tennessee Black Power Position Paper to look at um, a section of the three-part position paper that the Atlanta Project jointly wrote. Thank you so much. And uh, that's exactly what I wanted to do is to stimulate that type of information. Um, now, what, what was the name of the book that you just mentioned? State on Freedom by Dan Berger. And it's a biography of Gwen Sahara Simmons and Michael Simmons, who were SNCC workers. Um, and it traces their uh, involvement from college students through a, um, up until the very recent, um, through their adulthood, their professional um, life. Michael led the um, SNCC's um, anti draft, anti war campaigns, was uh, convicted of draft evasion, spent three years in prison. Um, Sahara, who was uh, a member of the project, the Atlanta Project, co-chair co of the, co-director of the project. She had been um, the project director of various other um, SNCC projects, including, uh, I think her longest was in North Mississippi. Um, she went through some of the, she had been a Spelman student, but was, of course, dismissed, um, along with Vincent Harding, Howard Zinn, Thornton Lynn, and uh, a number of the other um, generally considered liberal uh, professors of the day. She uh, came, we, the project originally started for the special election of Julian Bond when Julian was refused to seat in the Georgia legislature after having delivered the organization's position on the US war on Vietnam in his capacity as secretary and following the successful litigation and re-election campaign, the Atlanta Project under the direction of uh, William Bill Weir from Natchez, Mississippi, a former Air Force uh, member, um, began to, to seriously ask, uh, ask and answer the question of where do we go from here? Because at that point, uh, SNCC and the movement had gone through a number of various um, activities, including the challenge of the Democratic Party and um, 
in Atlantic City. So the, the usefulness of electoral politics had already been tested and found wanting. So the question was, what do we think is serious about liberation? And what is it that we should be doing in this country to, to achieve liberation? And how do we how, how do we do that? Especially looking at the work of the struggles of emerging African nations and other countries, other oppressed people, colonized peoples around around the world. So it was a and also being under the influence of Malcolm X, at the beginning of a real shift in the thinking and in the approach to the struggle for human rights in the United States. Thank you so much. Uh, and someone just asked if you could include the book and that information in the chat so that everyone can get access to it, please. Yes, I'll do that. Okay. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? Brother Roney? Yes, it's important to remember that when Stokely Carmichael was in England, um, there was an actual disinformation campaign and an organization was created to send out disinformation to um, destroy any of his input regarding uh, Pan-Africanism. So I can probably find their name, but in the annals of military intelligence and espionage and so forth, uh, the British, um, these, this was a British-based organization, I think I could find it if I look really quickly, that was doing the very same things that so many of the other organizations did by spreading, intentionally spreading disinformation to try to reduce the ability of people like Stokely to uh, propagate information on the changes that are critical. So it's all in keeping with all of the policies that have been out there to try to destroy history. I would encourage people to um, also Google COINTELPRO um, uh, for appreciation for that period, in, which was a transitional period, especially from civil rights even though Martin Luther King was under surveillance and included in the a target of COINTELPRO, there was much more probing on people like Romney and the Black Panther Party um, and organizations that were generally considered um, to be less malleable, less sellable, less uh, sanitizable, which of course King and the SCLC has been become. Okay. Um, Britt, there was a question that um, when will the recording be, when and where will the um, <clears throat> recording be uh, available? Uh, the recordings are generally available within 24 hours, uh, say at no longer than two days. And that we're, we're going to have a, uh, if you go to the Majeska school.com, M O D J E S K A school.com, you'll be able to click on class recordings and be able to see all of them. And this is a, a component of the Majeska school. And it's the first serious edition of a class, uh, a series of classes. And it's the type of thing that we've been wanting to do for a while. I really do thank Dr. Coleman for being the one to step up and bring the knowledge that he has at his hand uh, to the table. And that, uh, Dr. Coleman, you were supposed to talk about when you're going to have your next class. We we've got to get that straight. Okay, next Sunday at 6.30. And so people need to, now we don't know, Bernie, I don't know who's all here. Um, that's not true. I think I can check Zoom and see everybody and add them to a list of um, people that want to plug into this so we can send them notices, your additional reading suggestions and whatnot, and create some type of communication between the people that are interested in the class. So should uh, should uh, everyone put that email in the 
You know, we have, we, when people, they wouldn't be here if they didn't register. Okay. When they registered, we got their email. I'm reminding okay. myself that we already know who registered. Now, some of the people registered, 42 people registered, 33 showed up, which is a very, very good batting average, Dr. Gallman. you got a good fan base. Let's work it. <laughs> and you had somebody else here that's pretending to be you. Is Burnett, other Burnett Gallman, is that one of your, one of yours? That's my brother from Montgomery, Alabama. Your no, brother had not. your brother had his hand up for a while. You didn't yeah. call him now. I, <laughs> Peace and blessings. That. Peace and blessings. Thank you so very much. I was a late uh, register, uh, but I uh, wanted to make sure that I uh, participated and uh, listened to Dr. Gallman's uh, lecture. And hopefully, we'll be on um, next Sunday as well. All righty, that's great. Well, Dr. Gallman, you want to take us out? Well, before you do that, the name of oh. that group was the Information Research Department. Mm. Okay. Well, I want to just end with uh, the words written by my late brother, Lister Belt Middleton. Um, he wrote a poem entitled On the Origin of Things. But uh, the last lines, I think, are very, very important. And I'd like to end with that. And they are minute by minute, hour by hour. As you lose your history, you lose your power. Hmm. So sharpen your eyes and tune your ear so you'll know what you see, understand what you hear. Thank you all very much.